Hello everybody, welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is the Trader Merlin Show and I'm in a completely different place. I'm hoping that everybody uh, is gonna have a great show today and give me some feedback on the program. As you can see, I no longer have this big blue cloth behind me. I redid my whole trading office. Put a little some nice scene behind you. We'll be doing some other things here in the near future, but uh, this is our Monday show. Big shout out to Marco, Austin, Siraj, Nat, Big Eb, Gino, Gaier, Terry, you guys are all, and Sam, welcome back Sam. Pepper as well. Hope you guys had a great trading session out there. And uh, for those of you that are listening to the iTunes podcast, I'm talking to the group from our YouTube channel. So if you want to see the video of this one, check out the YouTube channel as we broadcast live at 2 p.m. every day. All right. Um, no guests today. I do have a couple guests lined up for this week. We're going to have uh, Tim Pessett talking Forex on tomorrow's show. We will have Steve Moses on Wednesday. And I might have another guest either on Thursday or Friday. Uh, but I, I have so many questions I need to get answered. And I feel like I'm falling way behind on answering all your questions. So uh, I may do another Q&A session on Friday or Thursday as well. Okay. Uh, let's start off with your market update. Now, there, as we go too, by the way, um, let me know if there's audio issues. Two major announcements, actually. You guys had some buffering issues. Um, the software I'm using had some problems with that. What I did is I I rebuilt a whole new computer. I could do a, I could do a show on how to build a computer because the computer I built is badass. I mean, this thing is amazing. I ran it for 24 hours over the weekend, running everything I could. All the applications, not one dropped frame. Not only that, but I'm running at a much higher compression rate and... I got fiber optic over the weekend from AT&T, so my, my hope is that the investments I've made in this show will pay dividends and we won't have any more issues, so hopefully lighting is better, audio sounds good as well, and uh, I made some other progress, which I'll let you guys know about in your future, but let me know if there's something that isn't uh, going well, and I will do my best to fix it. Okay, um, let's start with that market update. Now, there is something very interesting that I have in my 20 plus years. I always lose track of the time. I'll say 24 years since I really got started in 1996. There is something happened today that I have never seen when going through our market update. Well, yeah, yeah, I can actually say I've never seen it like this. I'm going to leave that as a cliffhanger for you guys to fill in the blanks. After I run through my top seven on this update, I want you to tell me what you see that uh, was unique about today. So let's start off with our worst performer out there, crude oil. Thank goodness I jumped ship on this one on Friday. I actually did buy back in last night when we gapped down. We had that really nice gap down, um, and I bought in on that one. Just one contract to have some skin in the game, but um, uh, hopefully it actually was doing great. Now it's giving back a bit of those gains. Crude oil on the day, though, down 7.34%. And it's crazy. When you look at this chart, it does not look like a 7% drop, right? It looks like ah, just a minor little pullback here. No, that was a 7. Point 3-4% drop, brought it all the way back down to 26.26. Remember, just a, a day or two ago on this chart specifically, we're up tapping that $29 mark on the futures, we're up at 31. Um, but all in all, a pretty ugly day out there for crude oil, even though uh, you know it was, it was due to have a little bit of a retracement or pullback from that uh, previous uh, two-day rally. Um, Alpha says, what software is this? I'm using a software, it's, it's OBS. It's basically an open broadcasting software. There were a bunch of different ones that you can get. Some, some don't uh, have as much features and functionality. This one, you can do anything, but it's open source, so it's not user-friendly at all. So I spent a ton of time trying to figure this thing out, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool once you get to work with it. Okay, uh, that was your number seven. Number six is going to gold. So remember, we went from negative 7.34 on crude oil and our next biggest loser was a gainer of 3.49%. So gold finished today at 17.03. Right now it's about 17.05. Uh, 3.49%, 3.49%, jumping 57 bucks per ounce. And lo and behold, as I thought would happen, we are now right back up through that $1,700 mark. Now we did not close above it. You can see we knifed through it, but we pulled back, didn't close um, above it, which to me is a little bit bearish. It, as soon as we get a close above 17, then I think you really see some more upside movements to this one. All right, that was number six. Number five brings us to cryptos, which was up 7.34%. Now, this is a little bit out of order because it's changed. Let me refresh. Maybe it's down a little bit and puts it back in order for me. No, 7.16% for Bitcoin. I will change the perspective here as well so it looks a little bit bigger and I can stop doing all the ads for Coinbase, which I don't want to 
do average for them. Uh, 7,244 up 7.16% on the day, making it really your like number four or three. They really kind of shifted around here um, as I, these numbers have bounced since I started the show. All right, we're going to back to click. We'll go to your S&P. Here's the ES on the day. I lost I did I lost a pretty good amount of money this morning on ES. I was trying to short some levels and man, this thing just would not stop and it would sit there and hesitate at a level. Felt like it was about to turn and all of a sudden just rip in like 60 seconds you'd see the thing move 15 points. It was just crazy out there for the S&P today. Um, on the day you saw the S&P closing at 2663. It's down a little bit in the after hour session right now. All in all that puts a gain of about 7. Point uh, seven point zero three percent for the S and P. That was a hundred and seventy five point gain out there. So a great day for anybody who's looking for that buy the buy the bounce and, and see if this market return to some highs. Next on the list is Nasdaq one hundred five hundred and forty point move for the Nasdaq Composite five uh, S and P or Nasdaq one hundred right around the same. We finished the day eight thousand and twenty eight for the. NASDAQ 100. And what's noteworthy about this one is we had this little blue line right around 8,000. I actually thought we would stop there. Um, I didn't trade this one. I was actually in the S&P. But we ripped right through that 8,000 mark on the NASDAQ 100, which is really positive. Really what that means is you're looking about maybe another 330 point move before we come into any any issues um, with regards to the technicals and supply zones coming up. So all in all, looks pretty bullish out there. I hate to admit it, but uh, I think we might be due for a little bit of a rally. Okay, I'm um, going, I don't want to skip the Dow, I'm skipping the Dow, we'll go to Russell, here's your RTY, Russell 2000, 1125, it actually closed at 1138, which is a gain of 8.24%, guys, these are some big numbers we're putting up, uh, but that made it your second place finisher, technically, it's not looking as bullish as the other indexes, I think you guys can see that, for everybody who's looking at relative strength, meaning how do we compare one market to another, check out this picture right here of the Russell, okay, Notice that it has not been able to breach these highs that we achieved on the 26th and 27th of March. But if I look at that S&P, S&P has broken those highs. NASDAQ has broken those highs. And then you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it just broke it. So clearly, the Russell 2000 is the weaker of the bunch here. But today, it was definitely the big, uh, big mover to the upside. But that wasn't your best performer. Uh, I was actually really thinking we'd see these 10-year yields continue to drop. Well, today we saw a nice spike up to the tune of about 15%. It jumped to 0.676 on the day, and you can see that reflected here by a nice little red candle. Um, I actually really thought we'd come up and challenge this 140 mark on this 10-year U.S. Treasury note futures. That, my friends, is your market update and your top seven markets out there. So let me ask you this. As I went through those top seven markets, was there anything that seemed a little bit different about today's top seven? Okay. I still went through the same basic seven instruments, but what was noteworthy about the pictures you saw or the numbers that I read? Did anything stand out? Anybody catch that? I was paying attention? Because today is, honestly, it's one of those days, I don't think I've ever seen that happen before, um, but I figured I may as well engage the audience here. Let me see um, see if you guys can figure it out. Yes, the dead cat bounce, Austin. Uh, I think uh, Alpha's right. This is a dead lion bounce. It's crazy, especially because of all the things. Um, let's see, anybody got any input on that one? Well, we all know the market isn't just magically going to bounce back. No, I think a lot of what you guys said is this is kind of that FOMO, that fear of missing out. I personally think that's what this rally is. I think it's just a, 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 going to be fueled by people who feel like, oh, shoot, I want to make sure I get back in. Again, we are not out of this quarantine at all, and things are suffering. Um, thanks, Jorge. Love the background. All right, so here is the, the thing that happened. Only one down, and others are up above 5%. Yeah. Yeah. I've never seen it where I've done all seven of these market indexes and we haven't had like a half a percent gain or one percent gain. We had the worst performer was negative seven and then the next jump was let's call it three and a half percent positive for gold. Nothing was under three and a half percent either gain or loss. I mean these are huge numbers that are being put up which goes back to the discussion that Sam Evans and I had over on Friday which is talk about you know you really have to be careful in controlling your position size. I'm sure some of you have experienced that. Um, you've probably put on some trades that you would normally do with, let's say, two contracts, and all of a sudden you're going, whoa, wait a minute. In two, with two contracts, in a period of two hours, I'm seeing bigger moves than I have you know, over the course of a week on some of these markets. So pretty crazy moves out there. Today was definitely noteworthy. You Normally when you look at it, you'll see something that's up a half percent or one percent here. Nothing like that. Just big rallies, or Jorge says big rallies, but also 
maybe big sell-offs too. Um, so cool, you guys got the one. Horry says you love the background. You know, I, I kind of like this one too. Um, so I bought these posters. I don't know if you guys can see it on there. I, I, one of my things that's in my trading plan is I want to I want to go someplace I've never been to. Oop, no, I'm gonna go to me. Uh, someplace I've never been to every year as part of my trading plan. I feel it, it, it'll open your mind culturally, mentally, just show you a different perspective. Um, I think sometimes if people never leave the US, they become a little bit sheltered as to who we are or how we're perceived. Uh, when I went and taught in Italy, it was just jaw dropping how the rest of the world saw us after 9-11 um, and our response to that. So it, it, to me, it's great to experience different cultures and makes you much more open-minded and understanding. So I found these really cool maps. Um, this map is actually scratch off. And you can see, I spend a lot of time in Europe, so I scratch off all of Europe, obviously over here in the US. I have another one on the other side of the office. It's just the United States, but I think it's a really cool way to look at where you've been, where you've traveled. Um, obviously the, the big voids here. I've never been to Africa and I've never been to South America. I gotta start checking some of that stuff off. So there you go. It's the little things, right? Uh, life's not all about money. It's about experiences and those things that they can't take with us or can't take away from you. Okay, um, how did they see? <laughs> Sometimes I'm trying to read the, uh, the comments here, I get lost. All right, it's question day, so I'm gonna do my best to go to listener questions out there. I will start off with one that came in from Arvin, and um, there is no particular order to these guys, I'm just kind of doing them as I, I saw them come through. Um, <laughs> Brandon, can't wait to get a debt. Um, yeah, you know what, yeah, you know, yes, I, I, I've been to Canada. You can see Canada was marked off. Most of it. I just, it's kind of weird because the way that, that calendar works is if you've been to one spot, you kind of scrape off the whole country. Look, I've been to Vancouver, Toronto, um, and through the, the very southern borders of Canada, but I feel guilty saying that I have uh, scratched off all of Canada. Okay. Um, Arvin says, what's your thoughts on the effects of electric cars on long range price of oil? This is a, a different one. I mean, this is kind of an interesting question because there's a lot of factors to this, right? And obviously we are seeing companies like Tesla just dominate the electric vehicle space. Although Nissan arguably is right there with them with regards to numbers of production. Um, do I think that the electric vehicle is going to create a big dent in oil? I don't think it'll be a big dent. I certainly think you're gonna see more attention to it. My, my personal feeling is this, you're gonna to get to a point I feel, and some of you, let me know what you guys think. You're gonna to get to a point where it's kind of like vape pens, right? Everyone's going, oh, cigarettes suck, they stink, they blah, 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 they're this, that, the other thing. So everyone's going, vape pens are so much better. And then down the road, we find out how bad vape pens actually are for people. I think that you're starting to see, you may see something like that down the road on the amount of mining for the battery materials or how that is becoming a, a, a damage to our environment because of it. I think that may be an issue down the road. As far as electric vehicles taking a huge dent out of oil prices, I don't really see that being a major thing. There are a couple graphics I wanted to prepare for you guys just to maybe put a little bit in perspective because we can't just think of our electric cars going to be doing damage. There's other things. Birth rates, death rates to me are key in understanding the trends and continuation of oil consumption. So I thought I'd pull up some charts. Now, albeit it's really amazing to me that a lot of this stuff is so old. Right? A lot of the data that I'm seeing is just really, really old. However, I tried to find some current stuff for you. So here's the number of deaths. Um, per year in the world. So obviously, if we start to see more deaths than births, then we'll probably see fewer people driving, and then we start to see things really uh, taking an impact on oil. Uh, this is a, there's two really interesting charts here. Number one is, here is the number of deaths per year. Now this is up to 2015. 2015 forward were all projections, which I just, why well, don't I have the actual numbers? I don't know, I just didn't dig that deep. I guess they revised it in 2017. You can see clearly deaths are expected to continue to grow as populations continue to increase significantly. So that's one part is the death. The, the new birth side, I found this interesting and I really would like to understand more about this as to why we're seeing these projections declining for birth rates going forward. You would think as populations grow, you're gonna have more people and maybe it's because of government controls or whatever, but you're seeing uh, right now about 140 million um, Let's, let's just go to where the red dots are, right? We'll say when this test was done, a little over 140 million births per year. And then you line that up with the, uh, let's call it, I'm gonna round up and call it 60 million deaths per year. Well, now we're looking at a total of about, let's see, um, 140 minus 60, you're looking at 80. 
So you have 80 million new people coming into the world every year at a certain point. Those are going to be driving some vehicle of some sort, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's electric vehicle, or gas vehicle, etc. Next step in this is looking at um, the growth rates. Now this, is, I think, Arvin, would be good for understanding the trends. And this clearly would show a dent being made ultimately down the road. Now who knows to what extent this curve is gonna to continue to grow. This goes to 2018. I'm sure we have some 2019 sales numbers somewhere. Um, but I thought this was rather interesting because I know Ruben, who's with us, has been a big fan of Tesla. I, for one, think that they are in a, in a dangerous spot simply because of their financing. But look at the number of electric vehicles, uh, plug-in electric vehicles sold in China. Way more than the United States. Now, we are probably catching them. I'd love to see the newest data, 2019 or even 2020. Uh, bottom line is China is way ahead. So somebody like Tesla, who's putting in a mega factory in China, could really benefit from the maybe the foresight of the Japanese or just whatever policies they have in place pushing electric vehicles. Uh, last one I had was the consumption of oil. As you guys all know, I am a huge fan of the trend is your friend until the bend at the end. And if everyone in here had to for two seconds put on a technical analysis hat and tell me which way the, the world consumption of oil per barrel is going per year, which way do you think it's gonna be going? Right, we are looking at the number of barrels consumed. This is oil uh, barrels of oil consumed per year um, globally. To me, that trend is going to continue up, and it, it I don't see it really stopping anytime soon. It'd be nice to see more current data, and maybe if I have some time or maybe get some money for a research team, I will. Uh, uh, have them do that work for me, but I'm just too darn busy. Um, Brandon says, I consider the EV trend unstoppable at this point. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you, but is it going to be to that point that... <laughs> anyone left alive in China? Funny, Stephen. Anyone left alive in China? I'm sure there's a few. Um, while I agree with you, Brandon, 100% that this is probably going to continue, this chart uh, of, of electric vehicles will continue to the upside. Will it go parabolic and all of a sudden we are now looking at no fossil fuel consumption? I don't think we'll get there. I've heard of other countries um, saying that we are going to see total removal of fossil fuel vehicles in their countries. I believe in Norway or Sweden or Denmark, one of those uh, Scandinavian countries. I think maybe a couple Scandinavian countries talking about doing that. I just don't see it, uh, to go back to Arvin's original question, making a huge dent in crude oil. Um, at least in the price of it. I think ultimately what will mess with price of crude oil is the production, supply, and demand pieces. And if, if we see huge demand for electric vehicles and that shift fundamentally away from fossil fuels or government start pushing for it, then yes, uh, it will probably have an impact on the demand for oil, which ultimately would push it to prices lower. But I think you're looking much further down the road. I think that's a long time out that uh, we don't need to, at this point, start worrying about. All right, let me see if I get any other questions. Well, two, I should buy. No. Bourbon says, Tesla is dropping major news, I think, later this year. Man, you know what? It's great about uh, Tesla. Is they're always dropping major news, right? There's always something crazy coming out. But, um, you know, they're, they've been surprised me at what they've been able to produce. All right, let me just make sure I can keep going with questions here. And if you guys have some, feel free to send those on in. I'm trying to get to as many as I can. Uh, next one's from Michelle. She said, what exactly did you see in the charts in the third week of February to prompt you to short the market? The answer is really simple. I didn't see anything in particular. I was basically looking, and we've been talking about it for a while, and I, I made other short trades, but I had been wrong. Now, the reason that I went with that kind of um, assessment and saying, hey, we want to make sure that we're looking to prepare for that black swan event was because of where we were Technically, that's all. I felt that we were way too extended. I've been saying that for a while, to be fair. It's not like I just said it that day. These guys that watch the show know I've been saying that for a while, that I think we're way overextended. Our markets were shrugging off any piece of bad news, any piece of bad data. It was almost manufactured to move up. So what really prompted me to, to be careful there was we had talked about on the show about how to prepare against a black swan event. And that was really done with Steve Moses, which was just awesome. And if you look at this chart right here, this chart was just screaming for a pullback. Now, I wasn't expecting this whole thing to happen and get ripped down, um, you know, 30%. That was clearly not my, my ex expectation at that moment in time, Michelle. But it, I was thinking we were due for a pullback. So one way that I was, we were talking with Steve Moses about how to capitalize on this, we well, maybe can revisit that because it was just such a great, in hindsight, it was an amazing show, was to buy deep out of the money puts. 
and I'll, I'll bring it up to SPY because we were talking about that on SPY was the, the symbol that we we're looking at when I believe when we did the example on the show. And the point was with very little capital, with a little bit of money, you could have gone deep out of the money puts, bought deep out of the money puts and protected your portfolio against a potential, um, we'll call it a black swan event. Right, so I'm going to put a horizontal line. I believe when we did the show, I could probably go look at it. It's on Power Trading Radio's website. We were talking about buying the 250 puts. So these, where that little purple line is, if you bought those puts, you're basically saying, if it gets down to that price, I'll commit myself to buy it. And we were trading up at the 338, 339 mark. I'm sure most people are going to look at this and go, why would anybody think it's going to fall that far? So the the price of those puts. Um, sorry, the, the the sale of those puts was was a great opportunity, right? There, you basically actually, I was buying puts. Excuse me, I was buying those puts. I, was, I got my thing confused. My United, where I was selling puts, uh, buying those puts were so cheap. Those puts were pennies, right? There was, there was no, nobody thought we'd even get close to that. And all of a sudden, because you had this aggressive move, and I so I sold out in here. I sold out, we were like at 311, 312. And of course, yes, I'm kicking myself for that because it was a huge down move after that. Um, but those options went up in four days, 300%. If, we, if I would have held through this low point we saw last week, I don't know, I'm guessing I'd probably be looking at a 1500% rate of return in a month. But it was because they were so deep out of the money that nobody thought it would get there. That was the thing. So we we're buying those things way, 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 way out of the money. And it was basically a risk trade, a high-end gamble trade, right? I don't say gamble. I don't think anybody really thought we'd get all the way down as low as we have. The point with that trade was, how do you protect your portfolio against a black swan? We took a small amount of capital in this case, bought really deep out of the money puts, and if nothing happens, oh, you know what, we lost a couple thousand dollars. But instead, something huge happened, and you make significantly more. That was that was what this, that whole point was about the buying the deep out of the money puts. It wasn't really the um, that there was anything particular technically, other than we just kept on going and going and going. And you know, after something moves as long as our market has, that there's going to be a big correction. Conveniently enough, we had the catalyst of um, the whole coronavirus thing, which really set things in motion, and we've dropped off even further. So. Uh, that was that one. All right, what's my next question? I might be going long-winded on this one, so let me see if I can get to our next questions here and, and speed things up. Karen, Karen says, what does Karen say? I'm thinking investing in ET during this interesting time. Can you give it a look and comment on your show, please? It has significant dividend. Does it appear more attractive because of that? I'm um, looking at a one to two year hold. Okay, I uh, haven't even looked at ET yet, so let's go and check out entertainment tonight. I'm kidding, that's not ET, that's just the ticker symbol. Energy Transfer, this is that wonderful pipeline company that everybody was picking, picketing on and getting all upset about. Um, <laughs> yes, Brendan says, you remember when I was saying uh, 50 to 70%? We aren't there yet, but I think we can get there. I think so too. Again, I'm, I, I think that right now all we're seeing is the expectations of bad numbers. We haven't even seen the bad numbers until earnings come out. So, Energy Transfer Partners. What do I think? God, this looks ugly. It's really ugly. Um, it's a great question, Karen. And, and audience, feel free to chime in here because this is just my maybe naive opinion of the industry. I'm looking at ET, and obviously it's been drifting down for quite some time. Doesn't look very good since 2017. You've seen it just slowly drift down. Clearly, we saw significant drops because of the coronavirus and what's been going on with the quarantine. Now. Then, uh, Brendan, I'd love to know why you bought a pipeline company. Because right now, if you're a U.S. pipeline company, the fracking companies are shutting down. We are below production cost prices. So what happens is I think that these guys are going to continue to see downside movement here until crude oil prices rise. Because if I'm a producer of oil, I'm not really, I'm not really excited about shipping oil. I'm not, I'm not extracting anything, so I've got nothing to put through ET's pipelines and ship to wherever I need them to go to. So I don't know. I maybe I'm reading it wrong. Um, I don't. I think it's a dangerous one to be in, to be honest, simply because of, of what's been going on with uh, with the whole industry. So let me see if I can um, bring up a it, big Ed. Did you pull that one up? Is it 22% dividend on that bad boy? I don't see that holding. Um, I'll look and see. I, I think you might have pulled that one up for me, which would have been easier than me trying to pull it up. 
Yeah, 22% dividend. I agree with you, Big Eb. Do you think that they're gonna keep paying that when all of a sudden they're, they're not making any money? No, they would probably move away uh, they'll probably slash that dividend would be my guess. Now they may still pay a dividend, but they're probably going to cut it significantly. I just you can't see them sustaining that when they're they're losing money, um, and especially once this whole coronavirus thing starts to hit the pipeline numbers. Let me see. Um, let me see if I can pull up their financials for you guys real quick, just so you can see. Oh, they, their their numbers actually look pretty darn good. Um, to be honest, here I'll, let me see if I can share the financial statement with you guys on the screen over here, so you can all see it. Let's go to doo -doo. Um, this is going from it goes from right to left. So you can see 2016 to 17 and 18, 19. They've been doing great. They've been showing uh, a significant amount of revenue and gross profit. Now, let's see what that net profit is after they do all their expenses and everything. Also doing very well. So this company is looking really good right now. You can see that their consensus for um, Q1 earnings is the same as Q2. I'd say that this is already priced in. This is definitely a big short setup here. So I, I, I think that this is, I think they're going to miss. I, I just don't see them doing well. I think that the, the number of U.S. companies which have shut down because of the extraction costs is just going to end up killing, not killing, but hurting uh, ET further. Now, this does beg the question, right? At what point do you look at a company like Energy Transfer and say, hey, you know what, I'm a value play here. I'm buying it because I know it's going to come back at some point. If we get... If we get um, OPEC and we get Saudi Arabia and Russia to say, hey, we're going to cut production and all of a sudden price jumps back up to, let's say, 35, 40 bucks a barrel, then these guys could be back in business. But I'm already hearing stories about different uh, fracking companies shutting down, you know, pulling up and saying, we're done. We, we, there's no point. We just uh, we can't do it. So um, I don't know if I answered that question exactly the way that you wanted. To me, it's not not the best company to be looking at. Simply, the trend is ugly. The price is great, but remember, these guys can do reverse splits, right? Companies can go back and do a reverse split um, and, and change their sh number of shares, etc. All right, next one. Let me see, look at my clock here. Make sure you got some time. Wow, time flies when you just do a question and answer. So, uh, Dylan says, "What are your thoughts on Nug T, and should I stay in or get out of it?" Nug T, huh? You want you want leveraged ETFs on gold? Okay, on gold miners. Excuse me, not gold. Gold miners. So first off, let's look at the gold miners. Let's look at GDX. Now, obviously, right now you're looking at a period of time where gold is is showing uh, good numbers for these guys. Let's go GDX. Boy, this is just giving me a hard, hard time today. GDX, come on, you can do it. Bring it up. There we go. The Van X gold miners, and there's gold miners juniors as well. Uh, this is the weekly time frame. I'll just show you the daily so we can see the impact from the last few months. Okay. As far as gold miners right now, obviously they took a big hit and they're slowly gathering their prices back up. And I think this is because they're anticipating numbers being better because of $1,700 gold. Now, if, uh, if you're looking at Nug T, I want you to look at this picture right here. To me, this is critical in understanding that there's something wrong in, in my opinion with Nug T. So if you look at the gold miners, you see they've had a significant bounce. And let me just for giggles here, no, if I can remember how to do this one on click, we'll do a Fibonacci retracement. And I'm just gonna do a Fibonacci retracement on this move here. The only reason I'm doing this, guys, is I want you to see how much we have bounced with regards to um, gold here. So you can see the gold has bounced back about, ooh, it looks to be about 70%. Okay, it's, it's bounced back 70% of that sell-off that started on the 24th of February, okay, from the peak to the low. Now, let's look at Nug T. N U G T. This is the Direxian Daily Gold Miners. This is a double bullish. Does something look broken to you here? I'll do the exact same thing. Here's the Fibonacci retracement from the peak to the trough. And you look right now, it's only bounced about 10%. So this is one of the problems with either it's ETF construction or how this direction is constructed. To me, this is not good. Um, this is this is this looks really bad. Now you would think that if you're buying gold miners and the gold miners have recouped 70% of their losses, that this should be up 70%, and of course being leveraged two to one, you'd be having a great rate of return. But something's wrong with this picture. It's not showing you those types of gains out there. So it does not make sense to me 
why this is so underperforming. And it could be because of the different futures contracts. Sometimes they're forward contracts um, and the way it's calculated can be a bit tricky. So um, I like the thinking, Dylan. I really do like the thinking, which is, man, gold's rocking. Gold miners are going to do well. I know this is what Brendan is looking at a lot of this, right? Brendan, you, you're always looking at gold and you're definitely more into precious metals than I am. Um, there's, I think that there's certainly opportunity out there in some of these bad boys, without a doubt. However, I'd be careful with this Nug T thing. The Nug T one kind of makes me a little bit nervous and not sure I am a big, not sure I'm a fan of Nug T right now. Brandon, would you say you have an alternative to this one or something that might look better um, if you were looking to go for the miners? Or would you just buy the miners? I know, I think I know Brandon would probably say he has individual ones that he likes to focus on. Um, I'm more of an index guy just because I don't have the. Uh, the, the brain set that Brendan does, which is he's digging through the minutia of all of these little details of each minor company. I don't, I don't have time for that personally. So, um, you know, others, others that do awesome. Cause you're probably going to find the better companies than I would. I step back and I just look at the ETFs that might represent them. Um, yeah, for Brendan, that's another good point. Brendan says you don't need leverage on gold on mining stocks. They move fast enough, but some people want them. Uh, leverage ETFs only do well when you're going in one direction. Correct. That is a huge thing. You know, it's funny. Um, oh, what was it? I was with a friend of mine the other day. We had this comment that like, what was it? Oh, gosh, we were doing something. Oh, that was going to drive me nuts. It was like I lost 20 something and then I gained 20 something. She goes, oh, you're back to break even. I'm like, no, that, that's not the way it works. If you have $100 and you spend and, and you lose 20%, you now have $80. But if you gain 20% on that $80, you're like, oh, I'm back to 100. No, you're at 96 bucks. So when something chops like this and has really wild swings that don't go in one direction, these doubles and triple uh, ETFs are just as dangerous as you can get. You're gonna lose money because of the percentage swings. Um, Dylan, I don't, I don't know uh, an alternative to them. I would just buy GDX, buy the gold miners themselves, right? Then the GDX or GDXJ would be the junior gold miners. Uh, I'll bring that one up for you guys here too. I'm not a, uh, I'm not the gold expert. So here's GDXJ. These are the juniors, little smaller miners. But you notice the picture's similar. Um, it's not as strong as the other one, as the, as the gold miners. This is the junior index, but. You know, just to see where we've come from and, and the, how much it's bounced back, you know, the, the juniors are up 50%. So, um, you know, Dylan, you might, uh, Brendan is always, he's, he could probably do his own show on miners and commodities and, and precious metals. Um, I don't know about an alternative to it. Like I say, for me, I would just buy GDXJ. I wouldn't worry about, no? He said, okay. He says they're crap. Don't buy them. All right. I see. It. There you go. I would have bought those just because that's my exposure. But Brendan, you're probably going to say that there's specific companies to go into. Oh, okay. Um, you know what? Maybe we'll get Sprott on again and talk about his differences because there's subtle differences there. Um, and he's um, Sprott Capital has been great. They've been on the program and, and been giving us a ton of great information. I haven't been on this show, but hopefully they'll be back on soon. Um, with regards to performance, you know, this is their, this is their juniors, right? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually underperforming compared to GDXJ. And then I'm assuming is SGD, the, the, the regular miners. Yeah. SGDM. There you go. Let's just, I'm just checking relative performance to see how it stacks up against, uh, the GDXJ. So, they're both underperforming the GDX and GDXJ just a little bit. They may have different components, um, but there you go. All right, last last question here. I'll get to, and then I will. Uh, hopefully, I'm, I'm, already I'm already past time for today, but let me just do it anyway. Uh, this one was from Scott. He says, given that Europe is once again turning into a mess with Spain and Italy going down the toilet, has Britain dodged a bullet by getting getting oh sorry getting out before the shit hit the fan? You guys all know my stance on that one. I've been saying this one for quite some time. I believe, yes, absolutely. I think that we, we talked about the uncertainty of this whole Brexit and the European Union. I think that the UK or Britain was was smart and saying, look, if you're tied to all these other piece, people that are bringing, it's like having bad negative friends, right? If you have a ton of really negative friends that are always complaining, always bringing you down, always belittling you and, and not supporting you, they're going to do nothing but drag you down. If you look at the European Union, you have a couple countries that were really the bellwethers, right? You had Germany, France, and you had Britain. 
Those are the three that were the dominant participants there. Germany, still doing okay, we can say. They're the fulcrum, the most powerful one. UK was number two or three. But all these other you know, countries weren't really carrying their end of the bargain. They were reaping some of the benefits from all these agreements. So if all these little guys are bringing you down, at some point you got to tether that, cut it off and say, hey, you know what? We're going to go on our own. I think it was the right thing for the Britain to do. The only thing I liked about um, the euro in particular is because I could go from country to country and use the euro. Well, it still didn't work in, in the UK anyway, so that bummed me out. Uh, but I think that they're right to do so. I think in the long run, it will probably be better for them economically, which is why we're probably seeing the pound take a nice bounce here over the last couple of weeks. Um, I also think that the more that they can work with the European Union and be amicable with their trade agreements and relationships, um, that'll, that'll benefit them even more. Of course, you have to understand the rest of the European Union is not going to look at it and go, hey, you guys left us? Oh, it's good. Good. Congratulations. Go. I would have a little bit of hostility towards um, Britain for that, and I would probably make it difficult for them to have trade agreements with us, and they'd need to have visas for anybody who would come into our countries just to make it more of a pain in the ass to them. Now, the second part of your question is a good one as well. We'll go to uh, full screen here and show you stronger GD, a stronger British pound against the euro, short to medium term. I agree. I think that the euro is in trouble. I, I, I think that they're in, in a world of hurt right now and probably going to have uh, more problems going forward. So let me go and show you. Uh, let's go to that one. One sec. I don't have a Forex feed on. Oh, I guess I could bring up. I got three different platforms I'm working right now. So let's see if I can get this guy. I'll reload. All right. So let's go GBP USD. I'm going to go a little bit longer term here. We'll start off with our weekly. On the daily, you're just seeing tremendous volatility because of what's been going on with the whole coronavirus thing around the world. Now, technically, this looks like garbage, right? This looks really, really bad. Why? Because it's just been going down and down and down and down and down. But this, I believe, personally, is just a reflection of the uncertainty and not knowing where it was going to go. So long term, um, I'm bullish on it. It's just I got to wait. You have to wait for this to really start to prove to you that it's going to be going up. So we can go look at euro US dollar. Same same picture here, right? And this is because the dollar has been gaining such strength. And we're seeing the dollar is up at a, the Dixie is up at 100 right now, which is, is a pretty solid number. Um, hasn't been there for quite some time. Well, actually it was there a couple weeks ago. But other than that, it's been a while since we were over 100 on the dollar index. So the dollar strength is part of the reason you're seeing this. Um, we could go, you could go Euro British pound and look at that cross pair. Now that's going to be more sideways. Certainly this whole, most of the Brexit pieces have been showing wild swings and fluctuations there. My assumption would be that once the dust settles from the Brexit and things are locked and loaded and sealed, that you'll see this uh, Euro British pound cross drift down. I think that the British pound will start to show more strength because of their autonomy and not being tied to the European Union's rules and regulations. So, but that again is just my my little two cents on that one. I I hope I'm right. Okay, um, there you go. So that was um, the question. I had a couple more questions, but I'm already way past time. Um, this is referring to in Europe. <laughs> a big app. I like it. I like how your your autocorrect fix it. He says this is going to be a cluster duck. We love cluster ducks, right? Um, <laughs> cluster duck. If Boris gets worse, though, yeah, boy, I tell you what. I mean, right? You think he get admitted into critical uh, urgent care or ICU today because of coronavirus stuff? We'll see if that um, if that makes things any worse over there. I don't know. Some people would argue it's a good thing. Some people argue it's terrible. Uh, let's see. Doo -doo. Yeah, Rick Rule can explain those products really well. That guy was he's he's awesome. All right. Well, I think that does it. I went through a few questions. I have a, a ton more, and I apologize if I didn't get your questions. I know some of you are probably waiting for your questions to get answered. Uh, I'm doing my best to get to all those. I probably just need to do an extended show. Originally, this was designed to be a, a 30 minute program, and I, I think every day it's gone longer and longer, and we're already at 39 minutes with not one commercial. Hope you guys like that one. All right. Um, any last minute questions from you guys before I wrap up here? <laughs> Thoughts on LK? I thought, Dylan, I thought you asked me that one the other day. I just couldn't remember what stock it was that you wanted. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me just get that one over here. Uh, okay. Let's see. I'm on chart. My charge is not cooperating. 
Oh. <laughs> Uh, it's it, the wonderful thing about working with uh, multiple. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about this coffee one. No, ugh. I I wouldn't t I wouldn't buy this with your money, dude. I, I would not touch this bad boy at all. <laughs> um, reason why why wouldn't I touch this one? Look, it, something just fell apart with this. I don't follow this company, unfortunately. Um, but something is clearly wrong with them I this this week that or this two weeks ago and maybe this is all coronavirus pieces let's go daily yeah um, I'm guessing that actually might have been an earnings thing where they went from 26 down to to six or reverse split four to one they may have done a or sorry a four to one split um, not liking it you know and the thing Dylan is we look at charts like this and you go oh well shoot it's trading at four dollars and 39 cents what a deal it's the lowest price it's ever been well remember you're looking at a company that, when it went public back here in uh, on the in May of 2019, this is pumped, right? Any IPO, you guys got to take with a grain of salt. It's probably worth a lot less than what that IP initial public offering price is. So what probably happened? This one opens up, got tons of fanfare because all the underwriters, whoever it may have been, are out there pushing this and pushing it and pushing it, trying to. Um, oh, thanks, Big Ed. Says the CEO is fired for cooking the books. Well, that's never a good thing. The question is, will it be the piece that kills the company? Probably not. Um, and, and Dylan, oh, yeah, fraud. There you go. Well, I didn't know that one. Um, I guess the question you have to ask yourself if you're looking at this as a purchase, there's a couple things. You can look at book value and say, are the assets of this company worth more than the share price right now? That's something Buffett would do. And of course, you got to be careful and know what you're looking for there. If let's say the book value of this company is seven bucks and you're seeing it trade at four thirty nine, yeah, buy it because most likely it'll be acquired for its assets. If you're looking at it from just hey, it's cheap and I think it'll be good long term, to me that's a gamble because this could go to zero. Um, that fraud may put into bankruptcy. There could be lawsuits that come through if, if depending on what that fraud was, that could actually end up shutting this thing down. Um, <laughs> um, so there you go. That's my two cents. And I, I personally have been burned too many times buying something that's cheap. Um, and I'm not talking about just products made in China. I'm talking about stocks, right? Penny stocks are a penny stock for a reason. A lot of people make it seem like you can make billions of dollars trading penny stocks. Yeah, you can if you happen to find that one that rallies up. And I remember people talking about this looking coffee for a while, but I never really followed them, never really made my radar. So unfortunately, I'm not the biggest help. Uh, Harrison, yes, 30-minute flow is experiencing hyperinflation, right? We've been I've been doing this show um, on my own for what? This is the second month now? So yeah, we started at 30, but I think the, we had like a 48-minute show the other day. It was already funny one. All right, what else? IPO's first exit for private investors. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And if you understand how these IPOs work, guys, it's really set up to benefit the underwriter. The underwriter and the investors who bought in early on IPOs. All right, Austin, you're trying to continue. You're trying to make my show go longer? He says S-Y-K, as, as my friends would say. Psych Striker. Is this the... Um, is this the car or the investment? Because there is an investment firm that keeps calling me and asking me, like, oh, can you put your indicators and trading stuff on our site and we, we sell them? Um, okay, this this to me looks pretty much like our overall market, right? It looks like pretty much what's going on in the overall marketplace. I have a uh, um, a challenge personally with, with really inflated or high-priced stocks. As far as technicals go, yes, you are coming into supply. The problem is look at that supply zone. You know, where are you going to draw it? You've got, it's all based off this candle right here. All right, so let's go to an hourly and see maybe we take a different time perspective of it. Okay, that's looking a little better. So now from a technical perspective, I'd be looking at probably somewhere between 168.50 and call it 171 is my zone that I'd be interested in on this one. And we didn't get there today. You actually have a shooting star today's pattern, which might mean there's some downside movement here in the near future. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Medical stretchers. Cool. Probably pretty busy right now. <laughs> stretchers are stretchers and body bags and masks. All the topics du jour. All right. That's it for me, guys. I got to run. I got some other stuff I got to take care of today. Um, if you have questions, it's real simple what you guys can do. You can go into, it's actually not the fifth today. It's the sixth, isn't it? See, this is what I get for, uh, is it the sixth today? Let me check my clock. It is the sixth today, so let's make sure. I'm gonna make sure we get this all fixed for you guys right now, just so I don't look like a, too much of an idiot. This is, what, this is why TJ is so great. He does all this stuff for me. All right, 
Um, that's your April 6th show. Again, you guys feel free to send in any comments and questions you have. If you have them, easiest way to get them to me is to go to TraderMerlin.com. Right on the front page is a little button that just says send a message or a comment or suggestion. Uh, if there's any comments or suggestions you guys had about the lights, the visuals, etc., I'm working on uh, a couple different things. But you can go here and go to TraderMerlin.com, send in questions for the show, for me, comments, feedback, whatever. Of course, uh, you know, give us a thumbs up on our podcast here if you like it, and that one that would probably be the best thing. Download the iTunes as well and uh, get your comments and feedback to us. We always appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. I'll have to get some of these on the next one. All right, that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much. Hope you have a fantastic trading out there. Be careful. I think you're going to see some wild moves continue this week. Um, I just, just you watch the way it started off on Monday. You're going to probably see some more. We have an OPEC meeting coming up later on in the week, too. Uh, I didn't really go into economic announcements today, so let me just, uh, for a quick quick piece here, let you know what's cooking for tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, the main stuff coming out, uh, there's not too much. I mean, we have IDB. IBD economic optimism, which is no big deal. Jolt's job opening is no big deal for the U.S. Uh, there's nothing in there other than an unemployment number for the Swiss franc. So no big numbers for tomorrow. It's really Wednesday, April 8th. is supposed to have an OPEC meeting, and that could be the dangerous one. So be careful if you're trading crude oil. All right, everybody, that does it for me. Thank you so much. Watch out for Trump speaking right now. You never know what's going to come out of that guy's mouth. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.